today we are concluding our six-part series on mission that began with unpacking our new church mission statement, amazed by God's grace, compelled to reflect the love of Jesus. And we've followed that up by looking at five core values that play a huge part in defining our identity as a church. And so those five core values that we, we've looked at first, we looked at gospel centrality, uh, discipleship, community. Last week we looked at family. And this morning we're going to be looking at the fifth of those five core values, mission. You know, one of the things we like to do here at New Mammoth in, in, in how we uh, teach and, and preach the, the Word of God is often we like to provide you with an outline of what we're going to be studying to help you with following along and to aid in your note-taking if you're a note-taker like me. Um, maybe you're not a note-taker. That's okay. But if you've never given it a shot, I encourage you to maybe get get a a notebook, maybe even, you know, you want to do it on your phone, that's okay, as long as you don't get distracted and start shopping for things on Amazon. Um, but it's always helped me. I've always, you know, struggled with, you know, keeping my focus and paying attention. And so taking notes uh, has always been a real blessing for me. And I have a terrible memory too. So whenever there's something like, oh, I wish I, I, I need to remember this, I can always, you know, reference it, whether it's in my, my phone or, or in a notebook or something. So just uh just a little uh, a plug for note-taking. But anyway, this morning we're going to break down our study into three parts as we like to do. And uh, I have three E's for you this morning. And they are explain, equip, and engage. Explain, equip, and engage. And so number one, explain. First we're going to open up the Word of God together to establish a definition and an explanation of this mission that God has called us to as his people. Number two, equip. Second, we're, gonna, we're going to explore together how God equips us for this mission that he's called us to. And then lastly, number three, we're going to look at what it means to have a missional mindset and how to tangibly engage the mission of God as God's people, his church. And so before we get started with the first point in our outline, explain where we seek to establish a, a definition of mission, let's first ask the Lord to prepare our hearts and minds to receive his word. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the privilege it is to gather together as your people and to engage you, the one true God of the universe, and your word, the, the, the Bible, where you speak directly to us, Lord. And so, Lord, I, I pray that you would amaze us with your grace this morning, that you would compel us to reflect the love of Jesus, to engage this mission that you have called us to. What a calling, what a privilege, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come and, and grab hold of our hearts and instill in our minds, help us to understand this wonderful calling and that there is nothing better than knowing you and being on mission for you. And so we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Christian author and theologian Christopher Wright writes in his book, The Mission of God, the church exists for mission. Jesus did not give a mission to his church. He formed a church for his mission. That if our identity as Christians is found in Jesus Christ and rooted in his glorious gospel, then our purpose as his followers is defined by our God-given mission. In other words, you were made for mission. Renowned British missionary, theologian, and author Leslie Newbegin writes, every believer is an ordained spirit-anointed missionary. Or as our beloved Pastor Tom likes to say, every member is a minister. And you know, so many of us make the tragic mistake in thinking that 
being a missionary is only reserved for, you know, the, the spiritual elite, that, you know, foreign missionaries, they're like the, you know, spiritual special forces, if you will, those that are willing to leave everything behind to go overseas to preach the gospel. And while the vocational calling of being a foreign missionary is something that is certainly to be revered, and absolutely it is a calling, the reality is, is that every single follower of Jesus Christ has been called to follow him on mission. You see, when we trust in Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior, something miraculous happens, supernatural happens, that we actually become one with Christ. Right? That's what our baptism represents, that we have become one with Christ. That our old self has, has died, and now we, are, uh, are, we have been resurrected with Christ. We are a new creation in Christ, united with him in his death and resurrection, but also in his mission. That, that Jesus says to us in Luke 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And this is the mission of God, to seek and to save the lost. And Jesus makes very clear that his purpose and mission in being sent from heaven by the Father was to seek out and rescue humanity from being lost and mired in our sin, brokenness, and utter depravity by being our substitutionary atoning sacrifice. Now what does that mean? That sounds like super theological. Substitutionary atoning sacrifice. It's actually quite simple. You see, Jesus lived the perfect life that you and I could never live. That, that because of our sin, our sin marred God's perfect creation and defamed his holy name. And there's nothing that we could do with our good works to make up for what our sin has done. And so the, the Bible says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death, that there is a cost or a penalty for our sin, and it is death. But it also says that the, that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so God loves us so much that even though we were, we were lost in our sin and we were on death row because of our sin, he sends his one and only son, Jesus, from heaven to be our substitute to be our atonement, to be our sacrifice, our substitutionary atoning sacrifice. And so that, that causes, and it, 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 there was a wage that needed to be paid. And so in order to satisfy the wrath of God, there needed to be a perfect sacrifice that needs to be made. And it says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And what that means is, is what we can all agree about right now is that there are no perfect people in this room right now. There are no perfect people in this world right now. We are all sinners. Amen? We are all sinners. But there is only one who is sinless, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, that he lived the perfect life that none of us could ever live to be our substitutionary atoning sacrifice. And so what he did is not only did he live the perfect life that we could never live, but he died the death that you and I deserved in our place because of our sin. And so the good news of the cross is that Jesus defeated sin and death through the power of his resurrection so that we could know forgiveness, eternal life, freedom, and restoration from sin and its enslaving power through believing in the name of Jesus by grace through faith in him alone. And this is known as the good news that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus offers us this salvation to be received. And the way we receive this gift is through faith. And you know, the Apostle Paul, he, 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 you, you, you might hear, if you've been coming to New Monmouth for any length of time, you hear us uh, reference this passage often. It's Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And you see, it, it, this, this is just a magnificent passage because the Apostle Paul, he just summarizes the gospel and he connects the truth and power of the gospel to the, to the mission of God in such a magnificent way here. And it says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, he writes, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are God's workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so what Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 is saying here is that we're not saved by our good works, but rather we are saved by grace through faith entirely through the work of Jesus Christ. But we are saved for good works. So we're not saved by our good works, but we're saved for our good works. And, and you know, there's this misconception out there. There's just this huge lie that, that, that many, of, many of you may have heard, and maybe some of you, this is what you, you may even think, this misunderstanding, that, that there is this like cosmic scale that God has in heaven, and that all of our, our, our good works, he puts on one end of the scale, and then all of our sins, our bad works, he puts on the other. And if we do more good than bad, he says, oh, okay, at the end of our life, you can come into my heaven. If it tilts the other way, no, I'm sorry, you can't come in. But there's this thing that none of us ever think that we do more bad than good, so we all think that we're going to heaven. But here's the thing. If you look for that in the Bible, you won't find it because it's not, it's not there. It's a lie. I don't know where it came up from. I don't know who made that up, but you will not find that anywhere in the Bible. And, and so the, the thing is, is that we are not saved by our good works. Because if we could save ourselves through our good deeds, then why did Jesus have to go to the cross? So we're not saved by our own good works. We're saved through the work of Christ. And so none of us can boast in what great people we are. We can only boast in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who did all the work on our behalf. And he offers us our salvation as a gift to be received. And so just like any gift that you've ever gotten, maybe somebody's got, got you a really nice gift and offered to it, it, it you, you, there's, there's this other part of the gift-giving process. You need to receive the gift. And so the way we receive the gift of salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ, by trusting in him as our Lord and Savior. And so once that takes place, God changes us from the inside out, and then he lets us know, now, now that you've received salvation and you've been given the heart of God, then God has good works that he has set apart from eternity past for us to walk in for, for our good and for his glory. And, and so the question is, what are these good works that God has for us as his people? That, that think about that. From eternity past, God has these things for us to do. He has these good works that he's actually written our names on for us to carry out. And so what are exactly are these good works? Well, those good works are what theologians refer to as the missio dei or the mission of God. And that is the work of the church in advancing the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is the rule and reign of God. And so that's our mission. The mission of God is the work of the church in advancing the kingdom of God. And the Lord Jesus says this biblical truth this way in John 20, verse 21. He says, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And so in the same way, the Father sent Jesus to seek and save the lost. The Lord Jesus continues that work by becoming one with us through the power of the gospel, that when we trust in him by grace through faith in him alone, we become indwelt with his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes its home inside of us, and we are then sent on mission as his disciples. The Apostle Paul says this truth this way in 2 Corinthians 5.20. He says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, that we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And so this mission that God has invited us to be a part of, that, 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 that it's been born out of his very heart. And the heart of God, what we see in the scriptures, is that it's his desire for you to know him, to, to, to be in a personal relationship with him to enjoy his creation, and to be in a relationship with him unencumbered by the barrier and the brokenness of sin. And we know this because of what it says in the word of God. We read in 1 Timothy 2.4, it says that God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This is the missional heart of our God, that Jesus came to redeem, restore, 
and renew humanity from sin so that we can be reborn in him, transformed from the inside out as a new creation in Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and equipped for mission. Part of our identity in Christ is that we have been saved to be sent, that we have been made for mission, and that we've been born again to advance the kingdom of God. And so this now brings us to the second point in our outline this morning, equip, where we're going to look at how the Lord outfits us to carry out his mission by equipping us with three, three ways. He equips us with his power, his presence, and his passion. And so we're going to look at these three different ways that the, the Lord equips us for mission. I know there's a lot of different scriptures out there, so I, I, I see people writing notes. I love that. But if, there's ever, if I'm ever going too fast, please never hesitate to reach out to me, write me an email, reach out to the church office, and I'll email you the slides. I can even post them somewhere on our, our website or app as well. So let's first start how God equips us with his power. Let's look at John 20, 21, one more time together. It says, Jesus said to his disciples again, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. And so before Jesus commissions his disciples on mission, he first tells them, peace be with you. Now this typically serves as the customary Hebrew greeting. That peace, the word peace in Hebrew, it, it's shalom, right? We, most of us have heard that before. That's the typical Hebrew greeting. However, I believe there's a deeper significance going on here. Because if you look at the text, it's like, I, I don't think it's Jesus saying, hey guys, how you doing? Oh, is the Father who sent me? So I'm sending you. No, I, I don't think he's just saying hello. I think there's something more going on here. And so the reality is that in order to be sent by God on mission as a disciple of Jesus Christ, you must first have the peace of God that can only be found in the saving power of the gospel. That you cannot go on mission unless you first belong to God and possess the power that can only be found in the gospel. Listen to what it says in Romans 1.16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Now, outside of God himself, the only thing that is attributed to possessing the power of God in all of the Bible is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so if we go back to the first core value that we covered in this sermon series, gospel centrality, again and again, we see that the gospel functions as our power source that equips us and compels us on mission for God. So when we are amazed by God's grace and trust in Jesus Christ to be our Lord, Savior, and King over our lives, we are then compelled to reflect the love of Jesus on mission for his glory. And so a missional heart and mindset is rooted in the power of the gospel. That when we recognize Jesus' love for us through his substitutionary atoning sacrifice at the cross, we are then compelled and empowered to live for him on mission. And so Jesus equips us with his power, the power of the gospel. Second, he equips us with his his presence. Along with the power of God that is found in the gospel, the Lord also equips us on mission as his disciples with his very presence. Listen to what it says in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. It says, And Jesus came and said to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so Jesus doesn't send us out on mission and says, oh, good luck, guys. I'm going back to heaven. Hope it works out. That's not what he says. No, he says, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
And so after Jesus' resurrection, he, he appears before his disciples. He delivers what we just read, which is known as the Great Commission. And he sends them out to make disciples. And what he does is he equips them with his very presence, promising to be with them to the very end of the age. And what Jesus is referring to here is that when we trust in Christ, we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, of the triune God who comes and lives inside of us as Jesus' followers, where we are indwelt with God's presence for the remainder of our earthly lives. And the way we know this is by what we read in the Scriptures, what it says in Ephesians 1, verses 13 through 14. Look at what it says here. It says, In Christ you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. And so as the presence of God dwells within us, we go through this process, which is known as the process of sanctification. And so sanctification means it's a process of becoming more and more like God, more holy like God. It's how we grow in our faith. That when we trust in Jesus Christ, it's not like all of a sudden it's like, boom, I'm super spiritually mature. No, it's a process, right? We grow, we're sanctified over, over time. And so through this process of sanctification, what happens is our lives over time begin to resemble the character of God more and more. We grow to love the things God loves. We, we grow to despise the thing God, God hates. And we, we begin to reflect the love of God through our actions. And so this is the presence of God at work in our lives. And so, we, 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 we've, so not only does the Lord equip us with the power of his gospel and the presence of his Holy Spirit on mission, but he also equips us with his passion to seek and to save the lost. New York City pastor John Tyson writes in his book, Kingdom Values, mission begins in the heart of God. God's mission, desire, and goal is for his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. This was God's good plan from the beginning that every living thing and every human being would live in a good world and experience unhindered intimacy with God. And so simply put, if you truly are one with Christ, you will have a heart to seek and save the lost. It, it's baked into the cake. That if you don't have a heart to seek and save the lost, there's one of two things going on. Either number one, you haven't trusted in Jesus Christ. You think you have, but something, something's wrong. You, you trusted in something else with the name Jesus Christ because you didn't trust in the one true God of the universe, Jesus Christ. Because if you did, you would have a heart to seek and save the lost. Or the other thing is, you may be struggling with sin in your life. And that there is a sin that is just blocking, that there's a barrier that's preventing you from having the heart of God in, in desiring to seek and save the lost in, in being on mission for God. And so mission begins in the heart of God because God's mission is fueled and rooted in his love. That 1 John 3.16 says, By this we know love, that Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. So throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus shows in both word and deed how much he passionately cares for the lost through his actions and teachings. We read in Matthew 9.36, When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. In Luke 19, shortly before, before going to the cross, we find Jesus weeping over the lost people of Jerusalem, where we read in verse 41, and when Jesus drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. Jesus says in Matthew 18, 12 through 14, in the parable of the lost sheep, what do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And so just as Jesus' passion is for the lost and compelled by his love for humanity, 
as his followers, we have been gifted that same missional heart. And so this brings us now to our third and final point in our study this morning, engage, where we are going to look at what it means to have a missional mindset and how to tangibly engage the mission of God, right? So we've explained, we know, we know what the mission is, right? We, we've, we, we've gone through equip, we know what we've been equipped with, with the, the power and the presence and the passion of God. Now we're going to know how do, what mindset are we to have and how can we tangibly engage this mission? So you may have heard me use this illustration before a while back, but I just think it's so perfect in describing the missional mindsets of churches. I, I, I got to use it again, okay? And, and I know we, we have a, a, God has added quite a bit to our, our new faces to uh, our number over the past five years. I think the last time I used this, so I think it's okay. I think the, pa- the statute of limitations has passed. But J.D. Greer in his book, Gaining by Losing, he writes how churches have varying missional mindsets. And he uses the illustration or the comparison of, of a cruise liner, a battleship, and an aircraft carrier. And so first, some Christians see their church as a cruise liner where they go to consume Christian luxuries. They don't understand that they are the church, but rather they see themselves as attenders or consumers to be served. Their mentality isn't missional, but rather they have a consumer mentality asking questions only like, you know, can this church, what can it do for me? How can I be fed? Does it have a good, you know, family, if they have kids, does it have a good family ministry facilities for my kids? Will my kids like it? Will they have fun? Does the pastor preach, you know, funny time conscious messages that meet my felt needs? Do do I like the music? You know, it, it becomes all about them. And so if the church ever ceases to cater to their preferences, well, there are plenty of other cruise ships in the harbor, if you know what I mean. Second, there are other Christians that believe church is more like a battleship. They see that the church is made for mission. However, they believe it is the role of church members to pay the pastors and the staff to find the targets and to fire the guns each week as they gather to watch They see programs, services, and ministries of the church as the primary instruments of missions. And then finally, the third metaphor for the church on mission that Greer Greer provides is the aircraft carrier. We're like battleships, aircraft carriers, they do engage in battle, but not in the same way. You see, aircraft carriers, they equip planes to carry the battle elsewhere. That the last place an aircraft carrier ever wants to find itself is engaged in battle on its own deck. And so the goal of an aircraft carrier is to load up the planes and take the battle to the enemy. And so churches that want to prevail against the gates of hell, we must learn to to see ourselves like aircraft carriers, equipping members into mature disciples who are compelled to share the gospel, to lead life groups and and Bible studies and lead ministries that serve the needs of our community without the the pastor or or other religious professionals always having to be present. present. That churches must become discipleship factories and sending agencies that equip their, their, their members to take the battle to the enemy. See, it's been so extremely encouraging for me as your pastor to see life groups and Bible studies and and, and grief groups and grief ministry and men's and women's ministry and audiovisual ministry or worship team ministry, other ministry initiatives that serve our community, that all, they have that aircraft carrier, that missional mentality here at New Mammoth. It is awesome. However, at the same time, as we experience more and more people seeking after God and coming to faith here at New Mammoth, as we act as a lighthouse, shining the light of the gospel and the love of Jesus from this corner out into our community. We need to be even more intentional about making disciples, coming alongside people who are new to their faith, starting new life groups and growing ministries that serve the needs of our community. And so now that we've established what it means to have a missional mindset, what I'd like to do with the remainder of our time is is look at five different ways we can tangibly engage the mission of God 
as God's people here on mission at New Mammoth. So in my love for alliteration, I've broken this down into five Ps for you, and those are prayer, proclaiming the gospel, personal relationships, positional power, and places. And so number one, the first way we can tangibly engage the mission of God as Jesus' disciples is by praying on mission. That we read in Mark 135, and rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. You know, before every major decision or action that Jesus ever took in his earthly ministry, he spent time in prayer before our Heavenly Father, displaying the perfect trust, dependence, and oneness that existed in their relationship. And so if the Son of God needed to saturate his earthly ministry in prayer, how much more do we need to be prayerfully dependent upon the Lord and being sent out on mission as his disciples? We must be steadfast in prayer, asking the Lord to give us eyes to see the opportunities he has blessed us with for mission, for the Holy Spirit to soften, harden hearts, and transform closed minds, as well as praying for boldness and readiness to speak the gospel into people's lives. And so this brings us to the next area of, our, of, of missional engagement, which is proclaiming the gospel. As the people of God on mission, we must be able to know how to share the message of the gospel, how to, to speak the truth and power of the scriptures into people's lives, and, 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 sh- how, and be ready to share our salvation story with others when prompted. And that's why in our, co- our covenant commitment, our, our membership classes, we do exactly that. We train, we equip people how to give their testimony. We we go through the gospel with them. We make sure, do you understand the message of the gospel? It says in 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. So third, the, the next way we can tangibly engage the mission of God is through personal relationships. Rather than treating people as if they are, you know, evangelistic projects, you know, preaching the gospel at them, God calls us to love people by establishing relationships and friendships with them where they can be truly seen, known, heard, and cared for. And one of the best ways to establish relationships with people is is practicing hospitality. Whether it be opening up our home to others, visiting people in their home, or taking the time out to have a meal with them, time and again we see that in Jesus' earthly ministry, practicing hospitality was a powerful means he used to connect with others in carrying out the mission of God. Whether it was Zacchaeus, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, sinners, tax collectors, the apostles, right, the Pharisees, Jesus opened up his life to others. He spent time with them. He's, he was willing to meet them on their turf and break bread with them. And this often led to life transformation. The next way we can engage the mission of God is by leveraging the positional power God has blessed us with for his glory. And so time and again, God places people in positions of power and influence to advance his kingdom. Whether it was Moses getting an audience with Pharaoh and leading God's people out of slavery from the Egyptians... Or or Esther becoming queen in order to rescue God's people from the attempted genocide of Haman and the Persian government. Joseph becoming prime minister of Egypt to save the region from a deadly famine. Daniel becoming the third ruler in the kingdom to protect God's people while in exile in Babylon, as well as countless other examples. So God has put each of us in positions of power and influence. And not just in government, but, but whether it be in law enforcement or, or if you know, teachers, small business owners, bankers, doctors, nurses, lawyers, mechanics, contractors, moms, dads, grandparents, aunts and uncles, Jesus sends each of us as his followers out into the world in different areas of society, working in and through us in order to advance his kingdom through our acts of faithfulness and righteousness. And finally, the fifth and final example of how we can engage the mission of God as Jesus' disciples is by being committed to minister to a certain place. Jesus says in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you 
And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so throughout the Bible, we see that God will often send his people on mission to a particular place. For example, we know that the Lord sent the Apostle Paul to be a missionary to the Greek-speaking world. Church tradition teaches that the Apostle Andrew went to places north of the Black Sea. The Apostle Thomas traveled east to Syria and India. The Apostle Philip journeyed south to North Africa, while the Apostles Peter and James were commissioned by God to bring uh, uh, the gospel into their own neighborhoods and cities. And so throughout history, men and women have been sent by God to specific places and groups of people, whether from their own culture or from another. And we've seen this exemplified right here at New Mammoth, where from our own church family, God has sent out missionaries like Sherry Daggett to Ethiopia, the Risdens to Japan, Kate and Anthony Savasta to the Philippines, and some of the young adults Pastor Nick has raised up through the youth group are overseeing youth groups in, in, in Lincroft and Tom's River, and there are others staying right here at home serving as youth leaders here at New Mom. And so when we take the posture of a servant on mission, we are willing to leave behind our culture or preference for the sake of the gospel flourishing in that culture and place. And, and, and let, me, let me repeat that. You see, when we take the posture of a servant on mission, the mission comes first. And I know a lot of us, we're, we're gathered here together on Sunday morning, and it's because we're, we're nodding our heads. Of course, the mission comes first, right? We, Jesus has come to, to sent us to seek and to save the lost. That, that comes first, the gospel going out. But what happens is, and so sneaky and so subtle, that there will be things, whether it be, and it could be even seemingly good things, like history and tradition. It, it could be things like the way we spend our time, the way we spend our money. And we don't realize it, but there are other things that have taken priority in our lives over the mission of God. And so the question is, have we truly, have we truly committed as, as a church here at New Mama, to seeking and saving the lost with the gospel above all else. Here at New Moms, we are very intentional about contextualizing the gospel in order to reach and meet the needs of the people of our community. And this is why the areas of ministry we've chosen to focus in on are family ministry, ministering to parents and young adults and teens and children and, and marriages, because that's our community. People move to Middletown's surrounding area with their kids to raise a family. And so we've identified that that's a way to advance the kingdom of God in our community. People struggling with their mental and emotional health as we're currently experiencing an epidemic of anxiety and depression and loneliness in our country. And it's such a blessing to have Victory Counseling right here on our, our campus. And we're also committed to investing in addiction recovery as this continues to be a front and center need in our community. However, it must be said that for the overwhelming majority of us that the way we were exposed to the good news of the gospel was not through a church ministry, but it was through a friend, a family member, or a coworker being faithful to the mission of God at home in their own community. And so what I'm about to say is something I never dreamt of saying five years ago, the last time I, I preached a, a message entirely on mission. Because on the surface, it sounds like so not missional. Because whenever we talk about mission, it's always about being sent right? Going somewhere else. But with the cost of living skyrocketing here in Middletown and Monmouth County in New Jersey, that we probably lost close to 70 regular attenders or members moving out of state in the last four years. And so something I want to challenge some of you to pray about is what would it look like for you to forego the comforts of Florida or the Carolinas <laughs> by staying and spending your retirement years committed to the mission of God here in New Jersey. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I know we have some people that, that have moved away. They're watching online, and they're going to be like, Pastor, what's up with that? Like, taking a shot at me. Uh, please don't misunderstand me. We can be, we, don't misunderstand me. We can be faithful to the mission of God wherever God has us. And I know there are people that God has called out of here, called to the Carolinas and to Florida and are, and are ministering to their family, to their, their grandchildren and whatnot. But, but here's my point. I believe we need to emphasize being prayerful 
over being pragmatic when it, it, it comes to deciding what place we will commit to in living out the mission of God. Being prayerful over pragmatic. And so when it comes to pursuing the missional calling that God has placed on all of our lives as his disciples, we find ourselves swimming upstream against the uh, current of our culture that tells us to be selfish, to put ourselves first, to live our best life now, to spend our time, talents, and treasure on being entertained and comfortable in order to further our own agenda, achievements, celebrity, and personal glory. But what would it look like if each of us actively committed to being on mission by seeking first the kingdom of God with our time, talent, and treasure. What kind of impact would we see take place? What kind of renewal and restoration would take place in our neighborhoods if we, continue, if we committed to pray, proclaim the gospel, and reflect the love of Jesus by serving our neighbors? And calling us to follow after the Lord, and calling us to follow after him on mission, the Lord Jesus is inviting us to an entirely new way of living, the way of the cross and his upside-down kingdom, where Christian author David Nagel writes, one of the primary purposes of the gospel is the reordering of our deepest loves and affections. It gives us new purposes and desires for our lives in this world, here and now. Reordered love implanted in a transformed heart is the distinctive mark of the Christian. You see, when we choose to live out God's mission over our own personal agendas and comforts, the Lord Jesus makes us this beautiful promise. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. See, when we give our lives to God on mission, the craziest thing happens even though we are the ones who are, are, you know, supposedly sacrificially serving, we end up getting the greatest blessing of all, the assurance, affection, and everlasting joy that comes from having a personal relationship with the one true God of the universe, See, having a front row seat. See, God transform lives, rescuing people out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his marvelous light. And so I'm not saying that living on a mission for God is all sunshine, rainbows, and butterflies. At times, it requires significant sacrifice. It often does. And along the way, we will experience certain hardships and trials. However, we can face these trials in the same way Jesus and his disciples did, who for the joy set before them counted their suffering all as loss for the sake of knowing God and the eternal weight of glory, the love, joy, and glory that can only be found on mission, living for God. I'd like to call up the worship team. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your steadfast faithfulness, for your amazing grace and transforming love, and the privilege it is that you call us to follow after you on mission mission, that we get to be a part of this renewing and redeeming work that you are doing in making all things new, restoring this broken world, that you give us a front row seat, that we get to actually participate in it. And so, Lord, I truly, I, I just pray from the bottom of my heart, Lord, that we truly would be a people that are amazed by your grace and are hell to reflect your love in all things on mission right here in New Monmouth, New Monmouth County in New Jersey, and throughout the world. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.